now we go from uh, the the picture that Sakan has painted of uh, e-commerce and payments, and I'm I'm very pleased now to to welcome uh, uh, Todd Schweitzer. He's the co-founder of um, of Brankus, uh, an Indonesian uh, fintech. Uh, Todd is actually based in the Philippines, um, but I understand Brankus works across the um, across Southeast Asia. Uh, with financial institutions and and with fintechs, and I also understand Todd, you're an advisor to um, the Apex platform uh, that's run by the uh, ASEAN Financial Innovation Network. So that's right. Very very much looking forward to uh, to hearing more about uh, how open banking uh, is playing out in Southeast Asia. Thank you, John. Um, hope you all can hear me okay and. Uh, let me just uh, present my screen. Google Slides just takes a second. One second. All right. Uh, so good morning, everyone, or, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Todd Schweitzer. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Broncos. We are an open banking API technology company operating across Southeast Asia. Indeed, as John pointed out, we got our start in uh, in Indonesia, but we now operate across across the region. Um, and I'd like to think we're um, you know we have a a, a pretty a uh, unique point of view on the open banking, open API trends across the region. Um, so first, a little bit about me, uh, just beyond the introduction. So uh, Broncos operates in Singapore, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand. Uh, we have about 70 staff across uh, Asia Pacific. Um, we're a remote first company, um, which became uh, quite advantageous a few months ago, as you can imagine. We do have physical offices in Indonesia and Philippines uh, where we have you know, more than 20 staff, but um, you know, those are underused at the moment, as you can imagine, um, and backed by, 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 by venture capital firms um, in, in the US and Southeast Asia that have a focus on FinTech and financial services infrastructure. Um, what Broncos does, we like to think that we're solving or trying to solve the last mile for open banking in emerging economies. So what does this mean? We think of the supply side, which is API provisioning, right? So this is really helping banks and other providers of financial APIs to launch API products in a very short time period. Um, we also work on the demand side, which is API aggregation. Now, typically in, in Southeast Asia, we're talking about ag aggregation for fintechs and for e-commerce use cases. And I'll get into those. Um, we also, as John mentioned, we're part of the advisory council and we're a technology partner to Apex. Um, Apex is a region-wide initiative really spearheaded by the Singapore government and some large technology companies like MasterCard, AWS, uh, AMTD, um, that is meant to uh, reduce the friction between financial institutions and fintechs when they're when they're partnering on on API products. Uh, so we serve on the advisory council, really, as the voice of fintech on Apex. Um, and then the fourth thing we do is we're quite involved with uh, policy guidance and advocacy with central banks, privacy commissions, uh, IT ministries, depending on kind of the market. But uh, we see our role uh, in. You know, th this is an unregulated industry for the most part in, in Southeast Asia. And so, you know, Broncos has a, we think that it's important to be a voice um, to the regulators to help um, share case studies, observations from the market and and some, some, you know, gentle suggestions about what we think the right open banking policy uh, might look like in, 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 in each Southeast Asia market. So why does Southeast Asia fintech matter? Southeast Asia fintech matters because it's undergoing region-wide disruption to the benefit of customers. And I think it's, in my view, one of, obviously I'm biased, but it's one of the most exciting fintech markets in the world, right? I think you have an incumbent banking sector that is highly profitable, while more than 60% of the population in the Philippines and in Vietnam, for example, are unbanked, right? In Indonesia, it's slightly better, but not much. It's still about 50-50 unbanked, right? You have a very branch-centric 
uh, banking industry and underinvestment in consumer and SME digital products, right? As an example, like I, one of the banks where I'm a customer at in the Philippines, their online banking and mobile app has been down all morning. So I just get the 404 message, uh, you know, so there's just underinvest, underinvestment in especially digital products for the consumer and SME sector. Um, why do I mention this? I mention this because when, if you go to UK's open banking uh, website, the very first thing they mention on the intro page is that open banking came to be in order to spur innovation among the consumer and SME digital banking segments, right? Basically, the UK regulator was recognizing that there should be more competition. Um, and so open banking was introduced as a way to, to, to reduce barriers to innovation and change the economics um, to make uh, it easier and less costly uh, and more customer centric to serve those consumer and SME uh, uh, groups. Uh, third, there's a wave of challenger bank and non-bank alternatives that, are, that have already entered or entering um, and lots more to come. And then I think lastly, Southeast Asia FinTech and open banking matters because it's actually commercially led for now, which I think is a great thing. Um, it, it is not our point of view that open banking, open APIs needs to be a top down mandate because certain banks, especially, you know, some of the top banks in each market are not going to be very eager to implement open APIs. And my perspective is that's okay because there are plenty of mid tier banks, plenty of smaller challenger banks that want to be API first and are going to be pushing this and crowding in additional ad, additional um, supply and demand for open APIs. So I think it's a good thing that Southeast Asia open banking is commercially led. Now, what is lacking on the policy side is a little bit of the guardrails to say, yes, this is this is you know this is compliant, this is not compliant. In the absence of that, it becomes a big risk for um, financial institutions, and 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 that slows down innovation. But overall, it's it's these are all things that make for a very exciting market. Now, what I'm going to do the next few minutes is just show some real world examples because we can talk about open banking for days, but I want to show what it actually looks like in products used by customers today. Um, mostly Southeast Asia examples, although I'll give a few others. So this is direct debit, which in Europe is called the PISP model, payment initiation. So this is in the Philippines. This is the Gcash app, which is one of the large e-wallets. And Union Bank, which is one of the more, you know, they're, I think, number seven bank in the Philippines in terms of assets. Um, but they have, they are the, the furthest along in terms of their API capabilities. So today, inside my Gcash app, I click the cash in tile. I select Union Bank as, an, as a bank to cash in. I then use my online banking credentials and a one-time password to authenticate. It then displays the accounts I have linked to those credentials. And then I confirm the accounts I want to link and I click OK. This is a 15 second onboarding process. It's really best in class when, you, when it comes to linking your, your bank account to a third party app. Once this is linked, then in the future, all I have to do is indicate the amount, confirm the amount, and I do instant top up. Now, of course, behind the scenes, what this means is Gcash is consuming a authentication, identity, accounts listing, and payments API from Union Bank. Um, and, and this is really, I think, something we're going to see a lot more of this um, and good for Gcash and Union Bank for being some of the first movers here. So also Gcash, uh, this is with CIMB Philippines. So CIMB Philippines, which in the Philippines uh, is basically a branchless bank. It's, it's, it's a new model they're trying. So in the, in, inside the Gcash app, I can open a CIMB savings account, which is co-branded as a Gsave account. Right um, now, it uses the same KYC I used for Gcash. Of course, you know, a savings account will require a certain additional level, and that's okay. It asks for a couple more account details, personal details. But basically, I start the process, or I, be, I continue the process that I already begun uh, as a Gcash uh, onboarding uh, user. And then once my account is linked, then I can actually see my savings balance. I can do instant cash in, cash out to my savings account. And for CIMB, it's a customer, it's it's easy customer acquisition. Uh, and for Gcash, it's an engagement and transaction stimulant. So it's it's a win-win for everyone. Okay, this is statement aggregation. Now, statement aggregation is not yet super common um, in, in Southeast Asia. So I'm using a UK example, but this is this is Lloyd's Bank in the UK. So in the UK, 
I open my Lloyd's bank account. I tap the open banking tile. Uh, I choose from the list of all available banks. And then I cr use my credentials. I consent to sharing my account data. And that information is then shared with Lloyd's Bank. And Lloyd's Bank will display it in a portfolio view. Right? Uh, now, there are several banks in the Philippines and in Indonesia that are working on or have developed statement APIs. Um, which is really a bundle of services. It's actually an authentication, identity, and statement API. And uh, there is a lot of behind the scenes effort to for the regulators across Southeast Asia to create a, a regulatory sandbox for statement aggregation, because this is so important for use cases like credit scoring, uh, for financial basic financial management, accounting, reconciliation. Um, Another example is statement aggregation for corporates. So Broncos has a UOB corporate account in Singapore, and I've we've linked our UOB uh, account feed into Zero, which we use for accounting in Singapore. Now this isn't a pure API; it's it's a daily transaction dump. But the corporate aggregation use case is very useful, particularly for businesses in Southeast Asia that have real challenges with reconciliation. Um, Third-party authentication. So Singapore uh, just rolled out with OCBC uh, the ability to log in using your SingPass, which is your national ID and, and national authentication. So um, we're seeing very early examples of third-party authentication or authentication as a service that helps the customer to avoid some of the friction involved with traditional KYC, right? Which is either going to a branch or you know, or do it going through the online KYC process with human verification. Doing a single sign-on using your SingPass um, can really allow for instant account opening, um, and is a pretty exciting thing. And I know several banks are looking to implement this basically as a service, as a commercial service, right? Um, sold to fintechs so that fintechs can ride on the KYC that's already done by the banks. So I think this is a view of the future as well, outside of Singapore. Uh, Another one is financing out inside the e-commerce site. So this is Tokopedia um, in Indonesia. Um, and what I, what I find so fascinating about this example is you have, if you're a seller now on Tokopedia, you can access financing from 11 different lenders. And if you look at the lenders icons at the bottom, that's a mix of traditional banks, startups, uh, multi-finance, so non-bank multi-finance, as well as OVO, which is an e-wallet now offering lending. So what's interesting about this is this is not simply lead generation. I, as a Tokopedia seller, can apply for and be funded for and complete the loan application on the Tokopedia merchant page. Um, and this is a win-win-win. It's a win for the merchant because they have access to financing without needing to fill out paperwork. They, it's a win for Tokopedia because their sellers now have more cash to buy inventory. And it's a win for the lenders who now have an easy access for um, an, easy dis an easier distribution channel. And it's a win for customers because now their merchants will have uh, better inventory. So this is a real, ex and all these are powered by open APIs made available to Tokopedia so that Tokopedia can offer a inventory financing product on their site. Um, just a couple more examples. So I mentioned Union Bank. Uh, Union Bank is an, an example of a mid-sized bank that really shifted to a digital first strategy. And that's really that really took two components. So number one, setting up a developer portal. Um, for for basically to be the any online business or startup or fintech, you know the, the the expectation or the hope is that they come to Union Bank first to have access to APIs they need related to payments, account opening, even lending products. They also set up a, a separate entity to build new fintech products themselves, um, which is UBX.ph. Another example, just in terms of like homegrown innovation, is SCB in Indonesia in, in Thailand, uh, where SCB is actually building an e-commerce mall inside their mobile app. Now, the, what's so fascinating about this is uh, number one, you're you're now blurring the lines between banking and e-commerce. But what it also does, and the, the 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 value for SCB is that the payment options, of course, become SCB payment options. So you can do one-click checkout which is your SCB debit card, your SCB, de uh, SCB direct debit, SCB credit card, pay with points, or you can choose an installment plan, which is effectively a consumer loan uh, funded by SCB. 
So this is a pretty interesting view of the future as well in terms of banks uh, providing an API-based marketplace so that third parties can actually connect into the bank app. Okay, so overview. What are the open API products we see in Southeast Asia? I think there's four main categories today. So one is account information and statement sharing. These are the use cases here for credit scoring, identity verification, and accounting and budgeting apps. Two is payments. But I think what makes open API products so valuable in, in Southeast Asia is open API payments products help to remove the middleman so that you don't need to intermediate payments. So Sukan earlier mentioned that 70% of bank trans of, of e-commerce payments in Indonesia are still by bank transfer, right? But many of those bank transfers are still intermediated or you're paying some virtual account fee. Um, but there's there's unnecessary friction involved, right? Th these are if 70% of customers are paying online by bank transfer, there should be direct APIs that allow the customer to approve a debit of their account and a credit directly to the merchant. Without a middleman, without a two or 3% NDR, this is something that should be direct, right? But it's not just for e-commerce checkout, it's also for, uh, for pulling funds into your bank, right? To the proper PISP model. Um, you have two new QR standards entering in Philippines and Indonesia. There are, payment gateways that are operating operating this as an intermediated standard, um, but it can actually just be a way to surface a direct debit payment. And payments can also be used for corporates, right? So if you're a, if you're a corporate that has a number of payables you need to pay each month, um, having access to a corporate payments API in lieu of you know, uploading a batch file for processing can, can add for a lot of um, uh, improvements to, to your day-to-day your -day workflow. Uh, third is account opening and origination. So the G the G save example is one. The loan origination on Tokopedia is another. Um, there's new examples we're seeing around retail treasury bonds and and kind of basic retail uh, financial products to be purchased on the on the um, on on a third party site. And then authentication and single sign up. So why are banks choosing to launch open API products? So there's a number of commercial use cases, right? And of course, different banks have different expectations. COVID has certainly changed uh, how banks are thinking about API products as a new source of revenue. But really, it comes to five, uh, five, five uh, rationales, right, that we hear directly from banks. So one is new customer acquisition. If customers are not visiting branches, um, how do you acquire new customers? You can do that by having third-party account opening and third-party engagement of your existing customers. Number two is new fee revenue. So all of the examples I gave are commercial products that can generate revenue for the bank. Um, number three is platform revenue. So as banks are looking to build a fintech marketplace, um, it can become an app store for banking where the bank is charging you know, a certain percentage of revenue share to Third-party apps that are that are um, offering um, that are offering that are offering their services on top of or inside of the bank's app, right? Um, number four is data insights. So especially for conglomerate banks, um, uh, there is um, a, a huge data play here, so that you can combine consumer financial data with their rewards and loyalty program data, for example. And then product innovation, as we know, you know, for those who know, you know, APIs, uh, having an API based architecture allows for much faster prototyping and, um, and, and development of new products. Uh, my last point here is, I think for anyone involved with open banking APIs, it's important to be aware of organizational blockers, right? Open banking APIs are are new and there's a lot of friction with any organization in adopting open APIs, particularly in banks. So I think this is very important to be aware of. Number one is there might be other business units that are saying, hey, that's my customer or hey, that's my product. What you're really facing is um, a misalignment of KPIs, right? So a very typical example is retail, you know, consumer and SME products, or sorry, consumer and SME revenue is typically branch-based, right? So if now it's being delivered through an API, are you crediting that revenue back to the branch? or you're crediting it to a different business unit. These sound like details, but they actually can block the entire innovation. So it's important to keep aware of. Um, number two is IT blockers. So the API technology team inside a bank requires new skills and a new way of working. It requires a thin but super valuable 
team of in-house engineers that know how to manage and update and improve uh, the API products of the bank. And it requires agile, not words, but actions, actually iterating on customer feedback and performance and acting quickly and not just working on a nine month, we're going to build a box type roadmap, right? Um, and then the third is legal and compliance blockers. There are new technology. These are new technologies. They're unregulated. Um, and it creates a lot of nervousness on the part of legal and compliance teams, admittedly, right? Um, so I think these are things to be aware of if you're considering working with a bank or if you're attending and you represent a bank. And these are some of the typical organizational blockers that are um, that are often faced by by um, by 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 banks trying to launch open APIs or by fintech partners hoping to consume banks APIs. Um, so it's it's just worth recognizing that there, this is very new and there's a lot of organizational change that has to happen in addition to the technology change. Uh, with that, I'll take uh, happy to take a few questions. I know I went through that pretty quickly, but hopefully that gives you just one, you know, one small overview from our perspective about what we're seeing in terms of open banking API trends. Thanks very much uh, for that, Todd. Um, that was great insights into uh, the, the big picture global open banking scene, but then also how, how it's playing out in Southeast Asia. There was one question from, from Ram. Um, I, I think you, you talked about this, but the most of what you're seeing is um, uh, innovation around payments uh, and not as much as yet about the account information um, service providers. Um, That's right. But, but you gave the, the union bank example and, uh, and obviously there have been workarounds for a little while, like the yeah, example yeah, yeah. Of, of Zero uh, getting daily feeds from, from, yeah. from the banks. Yeah, and there's plenty of companies, you know, the, the screen scraping API aggregators have always been, uh, you know, have always been around and they continue to operate. But I think um, the, the question that's not yet resolved is what is banks, at, at least today in Southeast Asia, often have a view of like the customer data is ours to protect, which I think is a bit of a fallacy because, again, these screen scraping you know, aggregators have been around for 10 years, right? So if the customer wants to share their data and gives authorization to do so, they will find a way to do that, right? Whether it's printing out documents or whether it's using, you know, consenting to one of the screen scraper companies. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 we are working closely with uh, the regulators, particularly in Indonesia, Thailand, and, and Philippines to create an open banking pilot specifically for account sharing um, to basically catalyze and, and encourage some of the banks to to provide AISP um, APIs. The reason for that is we need to create a, a, some kind of trigger for banks to start innovating and building products on top, right? What makes the AISP use case so interesting is it's not a product unto itself. It's truly infrastructure, right? The PISP use case is a is a product, right? It's a payment. It's a bank transfer payment product. But the AISP, you know, statement feed banks or fintechs are required to build stuff on top in order to make it valuable to users. And that's what I'm encouraged to see is what sort of credit scoring or financial management or accounting or reconciliation tools banks and fintechs can build once they have access to these account information APIs. Great. Thanks very much, Todd. Um, so um, I, I think uh, between uh, Sukan and and your your presentation, uh, it's a great introduction to the the topic of of APIs in in Southeast Asia, particularly in regard to uh, to financial services and uh, and e-commerce. So thank, thanks very much for that. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.